Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. And my guest today is Robin Davis, tech guy and believer in human potential, which to me is, I mean, uh, it's one of those things that I, I just love to talk about. And uh, we'll we'll talk about that and many other things. So welcome, Robin. And, okay, uh, thank you. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and uh, what you do and how you came to do that and, you know, anything that you kind of want to tell us about. Well, how far back do I go? <laughs> um, I was, I mean, I, um, I went to, a, went to a public school. I had, uh, my mum and dad got divorced and I had about a year, year out, what people would call, I don't know, um, uh, confidence problems so I, I I basically couldn't go to school for for a while but then when I did go back to school I don't know how I did it but uh, I then suddenly became very bright um I went to university I went to Cambridge uh I did engineering for 10 years I did a controls and electronic engineering then became controls and electronic and software engineering then became a software developer then moved down to London and worked at Accenture for 10 years and various blue chip clients around there, um, migrating up into architecture and team management. And I found that leading teams actually really gave me a, a nice nice passion seeing, seeing people actually develop. Um, I, I went independent in 2008. Uh, just before two weeks before the the markets crashed, <laughs> good timing. Good timing, yeah, ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have my I I so I wanted to leave. So I could, I knew there was a crash coming up, and I wanted to leave and get another permanent job before that happened. But didn't two weeks wasn't enough. So I did a bit of thinking, and I thought, well, let's you know, go into the contracting market. Um, set up my own company. Um and been contracting till just before the pandemic, uh, when I'd engaged a career coach. It's a career coach number three, actually. Yeah. Um, to help me pivot, because I've never been what I call in the groove of everyone else's groove. I've always been one groove, one side or the other. I know it's all one groove, but, you know. <laughs> uh, but I know what I, you mean. I've never quite felt as if I'm on, you know, on the same path as everyone else, which is probably a good thing. But I, I, I did this last bit of career coaching to help me pivot away from the, the famine and feast life cycle um, of contracting uh, into more of a portfolio executive lifestyle uh, where I have multiple clients, fractional clients. And it's at the same time that I came across this thing called the GC index, which we'll talk about. Um, so that was one of my major services that I use in my portfolio executive lifestyle. And I'm, I'm still technically launching it. I'm you know, making a name for myself. Uh, just need to get some clients. And in the current economic climate, that's a bit difficult. But <laughs> anyone I talk to, fine. But getting... getting being able to get to talk to them is is difficult. So, so you've been through a lot of transition in your career. Um, yes, and I I think some of that is. So I mean, we're 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 part of Barbara Cleve's Polymath Group, right? I think some of that is because I am curious. I'm always curious, but I also get bored. However, I do know that I, I can get very deep analytical. And that was in career coach, career coach number two, that was. Um, that even though I'm very good at being deep dive analytical, I do go down a rabbit hole. And it also upsets me as well. Because I get frustrated that I can't do some of the things which I would expect to be able to do quite quickly, not very quickly at all. Um, so yes, I have been through a number of transitions, but I think I think most people do. I, so, I, so what does what does boredom mean to you? I, I'm I'm curious because I I also uh, don't like to be bored. So how do you you know what is boredom to you? Oh, 
it's just in repetitive tasks mm -hmm. all the time um, without finding or being able to find a better way of doing it. Now, there is always a better way of doing it, but then it's just the frustration of actually implementing it. So you may have the idea in your head, but you just don't want to go through the uh, you know, the individual steps of actually making it happen. You want someone else to take that off you. And and AI is actually, you know, can be quite useful for that. I've been I've been playing with AI for you know the last six months and uh it's, it's, it's it can be quite useful to to help stave off the boredom a bit and actually right. turn some of that around into curiosity as well. Do you do you feel like you're a creative person? I wouldn't call myself creative. I can't I can't draw to save my life. That's one of the reasons why I did the sciences. <laughs> yeah. Um, and use use computers, but uh, I think. Let me, let me ask I, it I, in a different way. Yeah. Do you do you take ideas and then uh, creatively see how they can be expanded and to go in different directions? And it, I mean, that seems to be the kind of things that a coach does, and then people who are entrepreneurs kind of do. And is that something that you've learned to do over your career? Uh, it is, and we'll see. I do have a, a medium energy in what we call a game changer proclivity. Um, so I do like to think about ideas. I do like to get ideas from totally unrelated subjects, you know, things that will all, all automatically inspire you and think, oh, you know, that's an interesting, you know, concept or whatever else. I, I can apply that in, in, in what I do. Can you can you give us an example of maybe something where that when that happened? Uh well, one happened uh, a few weeks ago. So I know you interviewed Alan Rayner as well, and mm -hmm. he's in that polymath group. And he came up with the quote in the polymath group. I'm going to get it slightly wrong, but it says, um, "Whatever most needs to be known is what's least known to be needed." Or some something yeah. along those lines, yeah. and I thought that I, I thought that is lovely, elegant. I I used to love maths at school, um, and beauty of maths is you know when you find an elegant solution, that really works. And and that quote, it was symmetrical, it was elegant, and it really said what the problem is that people don't see what's directly in front of their face, mm -hmm. whether they don't see it or they don't want to see it. And I'm coming to the conclusion that quite a lot of people don't want to see plain obvious that is in front of their face. And, and why do you think that? What is it that you're seeing that would lead you to that conclusion? I think a lot of that is today's society that it's it's so accelerated and it's accelerating even more. And people that I talk to in their jobs, whatever else, they are snowed under. You know, they they're just running full sprint just trying to to stay upright basically mm -hmm. uh, yeah and they you know they just have not got the time or the bandwidth and i i suffer i, I suffer that myself i mean my i have to-do lists as long as three arms um and the real value adding stuff i don't get to do because the day gets sucked up doing various other bits and pieces that by the time I actually get around to doing the value adding stuff, I'm, I'm too tired and it's the end of the day. Um, yeah. I so see. I, 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 th I think people would like to, to spend more time doing more valuable stuff, but I think today's society and the job market, people's security in jobs and everything else, I, I think people are, are just too exhausted. It, it's it seems to me that I mean I I totally agree with you and I I see exactly what you're saying, and that the the way organizations are structured, way businesses are structured today, um, is not or oriented around them fulfilling the potential that they bring to the company, but rather to fulfill some kind of preconceived idea of the of the tasks that are required to do the job on a daily basis. No, exactly. And I, I saw a, a post this morning from one person in my in my group, another group, um, saying about talent and 
you know, companies are finding it very hard to find people with talent, yet alone that will actually want to apply it. Because certainly people of, let's say, our age are migrating away from the large corporates. And I think some of that is actually down to the pandemic. But people didn't realise what sort of a treadmill, what sort of a rat race they were in until they were working from home during the pandemic and everything else. And they suddenly realised, hold on, what, what have I been doing all my life? <laughs> you know, what am I getting out of it? Especially when, you know, most corporates, you know, they, they show no loyalty to, to their staff. They will get rid of them at the drop of a hat. And people just think, well, hold on, you know. <laughs> That's not the deal. It was kind so of people, an awakening. People, people, yeah, so pe people are migrating away from that um, to spend more time, you know, living up to their principles, living up to their values and, and doing things that they like, you know, things that they're passionate about. So let's talk about the, the tools that you use to help people um, reach their potential. And you just, you've mentioned one already, but tell, tell us a little bit about how you work with people um yeah i mean i've as i said I've, I've done pastoral stuff in terms of leading teams and uh, a whole service line at, at accenture and i i always enjoyed you know having one-to-ones with people you know going through their daily challenges you know i call myself a servant leader i you know want to clear all the blockers from my team uh to enable them to actually do the work that they're they're best at doing but the the one-to-ones where you actually went through the career development and you, know, you you take an interest in them that's when you really get their engagement they realize that you know you are not just a a boss you know you do actually care about them and when you see them grow and develop it is it's great that was my pastoral side so even when i was leading these service lines i specialize in in architecture and architecture transformation so that's very process technology oriented lots of frameworks and everything else and i've always dealt with frameworks but i don't implement one framework at a time you know i find the relevant bits out of the relevant frameworks piece them together depending on what the the client actually needed so something that will work for them but there was nothing there was no framework that ever dealt with the people dimension Nothing at all. There was this is the fear framework, but that did exactly the same as any other sort of framework. It it, it put a put a label on on people. Yeah. It put them in other, other little buckets. So most people have a label, role title, you know, business architect, you know, project manager, business analyst, or whatever else. You are identified by your by your by your role title not by what you actually bring to that role title or not even the, the 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 situation in which that role title is used so like a project manager you may have a long-term three or four year project you want a different type of person to someone who is coming in to rescue a failing project and has to get their hands dirty so um yeah in 2021 i, I came across the the game changing index um which is the new people framework is is developed by psychologists they were engaged initially to identify for business how do we you know how do they identify game changers um you know the people like steve jobs of the world and and all that so people that come up with the brilliant weird ideas from left field and they did that but they realized there's a lot more data behind it so they came up with different proclivities so your proclivity is basically your, your natural tendencies to do things things that give you energy and things that you have energy in yeah yeah and we have the five proclivities um we have the game changer so they come up with the left field ideas we have the strategists who make sense of those ideas so they structure it and work out what needs to be done or whether it's viable we have an implementer who uh makes those ideas happen so they're very action oriented you know roll up their sleeves they you know they just want to get things done we have a polisher who makes those ideas perfect uh you know and or all for continuous improvement and then they still realized there was something missing and they found that there was actually there was a sort of aggregate score 
in the middle for what they call a, a playmaker. So someone who actually orchestrates other people. And this, this isn't proven, it's my hypothesis that a very good natural leader is probably a very high playmaker without yeah. knowing they, they know how to, they can assess people for the value that they actually bring and they can get the best out of them. Now, so, I'm, a, I'm a, sorry. So if we're putting a team together, these five things, these five roles, would you'd be wanting to staff, so to speak, to each of these five roles? Is that correct? Um, no, it's, it's, it, no it's, it's, it's actually um, each individual has energies in, in each of them. And I'll just flash oh. that briefly. Okay. So, so the green one, where I'm a five, that's the, the game changer. The blue one is the strategist. The red one uh, is the implementer. The ambery yellow one is the polisher. And in the middle, you've got the playmaker. About, so a... Well, you, you know, my, my, um, my approach to leadership for forever has been that leadership is not a role or a title. It's rather how we function and and that all leadership begins with personal initiative to create impact that makes a difference that matters. And that would fit really well into that little that framework there, because each one of those, you call it proclivities, each one of those is a way for people to take personal initiative. You know. Yeah. And um yeah, I I really like that. That's um and well, it's, it's, it's easy. I mean it's it's one way to to understand yourself and what makes you tick. So I've, I've done personality psychometrics, I've done Myers-Briggs and various other things. And you know, yes, I'm an INTJ, but by and large, uh, I do move around a bit. I'm also an adapter, um, what was it? Mo adapter motivational style. So I, I will actually gloom, I will become, I will mm -hmm. metamorph into whatever a team needs that it's lacking. Right. Um, Oh, what was my point on that? <laughs> uh, well, you, you're like, describing the way the, the way we operate within these teams or within the company. Um, yeah, I mean your 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 natural energies are, are, are what give you energy and what you can actually express. So you don't you don't know what makes you tick until you understand that mm -hmm. and it, the the, the myers-briggs etc and the personality psychometrics when you say i'm an intj people will say well that's nice but so what you know what does that mean what yeah. impacts can you actually provide it's too abstract for people to really understand what impact you can actually provide I agree. to yourself or to an organization whereas with the gc index we can just explain the proclivities, obviously a bit more explanation than I've given today, um, just just in a few minutes, and we get people to actually estimate what they think their energy levels are. And they're pretty much spot on. So if you can actually explain to people something so simple and they can get it so quickly, it enables people to actually communicate, as, as well as understand themselves, it enables them to actually they have something on which, in which to communicate or with which to communicate with other people. And that is the, the whole beauty of it because so many people are in, in jobs where they're frankly terrified. You know, they don't want to poke their head out because everyone has weaknesses, but this doesn't deal with weaknesses. This is all on your strengths and on your energies. Yeah. People don't want to poke their head out because they are terrified. You know, they've been employed as a business analyst. They have to look like a business analyst. But it's during this journey of, of looking at this with, with individual people and you know, even just talking to people that have been doing the same sort of role as you. I mean, a, another consulting network where you know, people have been doing the same sorts of roles as me, but they have such a broad, varied background that you just think if i just looked at your role title i would have no idea mm -hmm. about the richness that you actually bring and the, the gc index helps people actually understand themselves and what value they do actually bring because not many people actually know what their own strengths are or why they act in that way 
not a, not at all. You you only you only seem to find out what your strengths are by talking to other people and other people saying, you know, Ed, how the hell do you do that so easily? And you go, well, can't everyone? No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one knows that. However, like yeah. like everything, you know, um, bad news travels fast. If you do something bad, you find out about it very very quickly. But you don't if it if it's your strengths. That's true. That's very true. So let me, let me, I have two questions. I'll ask the first yep. one first. So how does a person um, learn, learn about this index and, and acquire the knowledge that comes from this index? How does a, how does a, a, a person who would be listening or watching this uh, podcast, um, you know, take the step and say, I want to, I want to figure this out for myself. And uh, cause I want my potential to be fulfilled in, in my work. But, and that sort of thing. So how how would they find that out? Uh, well, first off, get in touch with me. <laughs> uh, well, so, yeah. so, so, I mean, the, 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 so I'm, I'm what we call a GC partner. There are about 300 of us around the world uh, and growing. Um, so we use it as a sort of main thread throughout our services uh, to, to address that people dimension. So but they, can, they can get in touch with me. We, because uh, it's an online assessment, there's 59 questions online, uh, which normal sort of psychological type of questions, and it will assess what your what your energies are. Uh, we then actually go through it as GC partners or GCologists with them to actually validate it uh, and also explain it sufficiently and, and go through as to say, okay, these are these are things that you can you can glean from this. So, like for mine, my my red implementer score is a five, which is you know an average score. So you'd think that I'm quite happy to roll up my sleeves and and get things done. And to a degree, I am, but that is only for me. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves to get things that I want to get done done, but I don't want to do it for other people. And it's it's insights like that, but it it, it all rolls That's up. That's really into great. That's really great. Okay, my, my second question is, if you're a, a business owner or you're the head of a, a division within a corporation, how how does that person begin to, to rethink how their people function where this tool might be beneficial in implementing a new, a new maybe uh, structure for the team or the or the division, you know, where they they're going to work differently than they've worked in the past, and this this tool becomes a, a way of identifying how that can happen. And what does that person who is in a, a a position, an executive position, how do they uh, begin to approach this? Well, I mean, the, the, there's there's the bottom up and there's the top down. So the bottom up, if we start with the individual, you know, we do we do the profile for each of the individuals in, in a team or, or whatever else. And then we'll actually do a uh, a team workshop. So as well as your individual proclivities, it scales. So even to teams, we have basically five basic profiles for a team, psycho psychological profiles for a team. So, and out of those, we can see how effective that team is based on the context and based on the objectives that they want to fulfill. fulfill. And we can also go to business unit level as well. But we you know, we have various tools that we use or various practices that we use to actually get the most out of that team as they actually go. Because I do target operating model type work as well, uh, which is more processes and frameworks. But in that, people were normally treated as roles, as commodities, you know, five business analysts, 10 project managers, et cetera. Or even at the leadership team, you know, you're the leader of delivery, you're the leader of, of whatever. But we can actually go through as we go, once we've done their profiles, we can actually go through with the leadership team and say, okay, well, you really like doing that stuff. You don't like doing that, but you do like, you know, someone else likes doing that and not doing that. You can say, okay, we now understand each other better. We know what makes each other tick so we can actually trade off each other and work with each other it helps build up trust within the team it helps you the team actually gel together a lot more effectively 
so even just by looking at the team profile and individual profiles you get so much insights as to what energy is maybe missing in the team you know you can see problems arise before they even arise you can identify the problems it, it gives you one a talking point that you've never had before and the um one example i i i thought of today so you know a, a professional athlete you know they use fitbit trackers and all sorts of things you know to to measure how to actually improve how they operate they don't just have an annual sort of appraisal or annual survey in which they write you know which they fill out right to to Im improve themselves that just wouldn't work this is the equivalent of that so we can actually do the gc index that gives them something which they can yet then use going forward it gives them a lot of insights i mean people can have completely exactly the same profile but it all comes down to the context as well so like my implementer school when people understand each other better they're better at communicating what it is because they have a common language and framework on which to actually base it on the other side of it is we do actually use the gc index to advise you know venture capitalists or private equity firms um, who are looking at investing or taking over companies because we can have a look at the the ceo we can have a look at the board and we can have a look at what their objectives are and um, it's it's quite it's it's quite simple when you when you see the profile you think they got problems doing this and this and you ask them and they go yes you know we do have problems doing that okay we have something to to utilize so it's it's what we what we say it's, it's not a diagnosis it won't solve everything but it is a diagnostic data point that's something that you've never had before just like the you know the the athlete with fitbit and various measurement tools without that you you're flying in the dark because before that people had to try and interpolate what impact people could actually provide to a team by inferring from their expertise their experience and their personality so CVs, LinkedIn profiles, certifications, yeah. they had to try and infer what impact people can actually bring. Now we go straight to it and go, right, this is your potential to make an impact. So uh, so have you used this, as you have used this with your clients, um, is there, I always look for patterns, patterns of behavior. Are there patterns that are showing up, which are kind of clues that there's a vulnerability in the organization that this this tool is ideal for um, shining a light on and providing a um, a catalyst for a positive change. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it it definitely does that. We we also have a, another tool as well now uh, called GC Translate. So whereas the the GC index is for the people side of it. We also have a thing called GC Translate, which actually looks at written documentation. So we can have a look at strategy documents. We can have a look at vision, mission, um, you know, strategy. We can have a look at role profiles. And we can actually help them look at the energy within their written documentation to say, OK, out of this role title or out of this role, is this what you really want? Because looking at your team, you actually want something different. So we can shortcut all of that, make it a lot more efficient, a lot more effective. Straight away, I, I did three live profile, I did three live translations of, of CIO roles. They all wanted very different things. And I think one was a CIO for NATO, one was a CIO for the post office in the UK, and one was a CIO for, I uh, can't remember. Um, but they all wanted very different things. But then when you look at, potential candidates you got their profile and you can quite easily see you know, is this person a good match or, or potential good match or not you can't tell everything just from the role profile but right. you can see once you've shortlisted people you can, it gives you either as the uh interviewer or whatever else it gives you something that you could then talk about with the candidate so so it it suggests to me that 
companies where there is a, a strong break, to say, between the executive and the managerial levels with another strong break at the worker level. And that's oversimplifying the structure and of these la layers of an organization that, that there has to be some willingness to cross those boundaries and say, we need to be more in touch with one another. We need to be talking more. We need, and not only do we need to be talking more, we need to be listening more to one another. And, and, you know, in my, in my experience, that's, that's the uh, kind of, it's not the number one challenge, but it's one of the great challenges I think people in organizations face is how, how do you break down those barriers of communication and of relationship? I think it's relationship so that people can operate with respect towards one another and a sense of mutuality of communicating back and forth to say, okay, this is, this is what we need and this is where we need to go. And what do you think? And I think, well, I think that that's exactly right. Oh, great. So now we're in an agreement, you know, that, that sort of process of communication and collaboration, I think is really important. And it sounds like this, these tools that you all have developed are, are perfect for, for this it, process. It, it, it is. I mean, I wasn't surprised when, you know, one of my top proclivities came out as a playmaker. Playmaker and strategist are my top two proclivities. So the playmaker is the, the people person. And I've, I've always had very good feedback from anyone that I've I've led to say, you know, you're the best boss that I've, I've had and all that sort of stuff. I, mean, well, I haven't done anything. I've just, you know. That's right. Well, I, just, I just listen to you and I, you know, help address your, your problems. So when I came out as a, a playmaker, I thought, oh, that explains it. But, you know, even, even a couple of clients where they worked in silos, I just think, well, yes, you're all very good at doing your jobs, but you, you're not addressing common problems. So I actually just got managers from each department and I said, right, we're going to go down the pub once every two weeks. And we're going to do what I call bring out a dead session. So we're going to go down the pub, have a few drinks, but we're going to talk about our each individual problems that we're encountering and we can address them as a team or at least be aware of, of them happening. So um, they, they absolutely they absolutely loved it. I just think <laughs> to me it's who, common who sense. Would, <laughs> who would who would know that? I mean that's yeah, I, I see that and um I like you know, I think this is this is sounds great, and I think for people who are watching uh, the show today, I think um, whether you are whether you're a middle person in the middle of an organization or at the top of an organization, you really need to be thinking about how do we communicate better, how do we work better together, and and he, here is a tool that can help you do that, and I think uh, it's it's worth your worth investing you know, an hour, let's say, at the very least to um, maybe talk with Robin about this. Because I think if you can, let me put it this way. If you can turn around a, a an organizational structure that's been hardened over years and years of not talking to one another, and if you can change that that climate, that that environment, then you have done something truly remarkable and probably makes it very possible that you will survive all the stuff that we're going through now. Would you agree with that? I I, I, I totally would. I've, I've been doing a series of posts on LinkedIn where I actually map the employee life cycle onto the Harvard Business Review service profit cycle or service profit chain, going from employee experience to employee engagement to employee retention, employee productivity, and then to the actual strategic outcomes. And I had a look at the the challenges at each of those levels, or each of those stages, and had a look at what the financial costs or implications are. Um, from a UK perspective, well, it's 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 quite scary how much we actually waste each year without oh, yeah. really recognizing it. And you just think, even a small change to some of that, you know, it's going to make people's lives happier. They're going to be more engaged. They're going to be more productive. You're more likely to deliver on those projects or programs because you know whatever stats you look at most projects or programs about 74 percent of them fail you know there's a very broad spectrum and you, you know it's always been quite puzzling to me i think you know how how can they fail so many of them fail but i think right. you know everything is driven by people 
bit less so with AI coming up, but you know, <laughs> well, everything everything's driven by people. And if you if 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 you have one or two people in the team that aren't bought in, that's it. That could be curtains. But, well, what you're what you're describing is, is you know I've seen for over forty years. You know, and so it's not it's not the the problem's not new, but this is a new tool to help alleviate the problem. And yeah, it's really great. So let, let me ask you one more question, and and I'm curious, and this is more a philosophical question. It's not a technical question, but it has to do with people. Do you do you believe what do you, what do you believe about the potential of people? I mean, is how far can how can, how far can a person reach in terms of fulfilling their potential? What's what do you see? What do you think there? Uh, well, I think I think the sky is the sky's limit. People have so much potential. I mean, give put people in a hardship situation, and they are very inventive, very innovative, and they will find a way out. Sometimes with help. Sometimes they'll ask for help. Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes they want to do it on their own. But people have such great potential. Even, but most of the time, I don't think they even realise what potential mm -hmm. they have until they are put in, into that situation. Have I been stretched? I have at times of my life. Have I reached my full potential? Probably not. I don't think so. <laughs> right, right. Well, I, I ask that because I, I think what I what I see in the research and the interaction with, with people that I have I, I have is that if to put it in the most simple terms, people don't believe they have something to offer in many cases because the places where they have worked has has kind of diminished that idea because it becomes inconvenient and a mess to deal with people who want to be creative. You know, they stay in your lane, do your job, do your task, and 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 don't don't offer anything more. And uh, when when it could be really beneficial if they if they were free to go do that. So uh, that's why I asked why I asked the question because I think um, most people I know are underperforming to their potential, but they have the, the if they were in the right relational context where where their supervisor or the head of the company said I believe in you and I believe that if you were to to give your best you reach your potential that it would be a tremendous benefit to our company, you know yes. when you have that sort of ideology let's say call it an ideology operating then all of a sudden people's perception changes and i would suspect that you have a much better re way of retaining high quality talent as a result uh yes no, i i i completely agree I, people are extraordinary and you know certainly if you've cultivated people within an organization or in a team and <laughs> they leave i mean it's it's great if they leave because they've outgrown the, the team and you know they're on the next step of the journey that's fine but if they leave under other circumstances where they just disengaged and they just had enough that's, yeah. that's, not, that's not good and I, I went to a round table a few months ago where Excuse this me. topic came up and these big corporates they they all sort of accepted that they they lose talent and you know how do they remedy the talent they were asked oh we just need to recruit more people i think no no <laughs> you're accepting the, that the there'll be cost, a, the cost there of recruiting new talent is so much greater than retaining quality talent and 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 i'll just you know i'll just say this other piece because what i have found um and this i mean i didn't see this for a very long time but i was always asking the question why do people stay at a place where it's clearly they're, you know, the people that they work for are not really interested in them. And what I, this is what I ended up realizing that there's a, this is a, this is a long phrase, a uh, long sentence, that there is a persistent residual culture of values that emerges from the bottom up in an organization. And it persists because it resides in the relationships of the people. And, and when you allow the people the opportunity to do good work and they're supported and they're affirmed for their good work, then a culture of 
of persistence and resilience emerges, which carry can carry the a company through hard times, um, and in and in particular into good times that really cause the company to flourish. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, whether you call it you know, sort of wartime scenario, or whatever else. Well, yes, in, in bad times, if you have that kind of team, you'll have each other's backs and you will get through it. And in good times, I mean, it, it may be why people like work, you know, some people like working for startups because they do have that small, yeah, that small team. And yeah. they know they can build up the trust. They, they can have the good times. Sometimes they'll just have to put their head down and, and, and get through it. It's all. Yeah. So true. So it's, it's so so simple and so plain. <laughs> well, you know the the uh, publicity tends to be with the people at the upper level, and never about the people in the in the middle and the bottom. So, so that's what I see. I've seen, you know, my, yeah. and, and so that's those are the people I like to celebrate and and to um, affirm. And um, uh, it, it it is it's it's it it, it is so true. And I I, I think. Certainly, people at the middle and lower levels, I you know, a lot of them just do turn up for work and just do the hours to get paid because they know that they don't really have any control or any say. No matter what they do, no matter what ideas they come up with, they're just going to get squashed. And as you say, they're going to be put back in their little box and say, "Right, that's your box. You stay there. Yeah, you know, that's your role. That's your commodity. Don't don't stray out your lane." <laughs> See. So when so what you're doing is you're you're a catalyst for change in a changing environment, and uh, I think that's worth celebrating. Huh. Well, I, I'm I'm one of one of many. It's a it's a growing sort of foundation of us, little little army of us that are, are, are trying to do good. The, the objective, I think, is to get to oh, was it four or ten percent of the world's population. Uh, I mean, we do actually have a, a young person's equivalent of the GC index called the Young Persons Index, which we use in schools. I'm not accredited in that. Um, but that's having such a massive impact in schools, certainly after the pandemic, with kids suffering from anxiety and lack of confidence, um, especially in this volatile, uncertain, cruel, whatever world. Um, they they have no idea whether to go to university, what course to do, what subject to do. Yeah. Whatever we actually go into schools with these young persons index, which is exactly the same as the, the GCI, and the feedback that we get from the kids to say, "I know, I know my value now. I do have value. I'm not a worthless lump of flesh. Wow. I do have value, and I can understand some of the time why I am the way I am." Wow. Uh, it's reduced, you know, giving them confidence, reduced in anxiety. And just seeing that, and I, 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 I say to uh, uh, GCHQ, I say, God, I wish we had this when I was at school. Yeah, me really too. It would, it would have saved me three, three lots of career coaching for a start off. <laughs> yeah, well, that may be the greatest thing that you have to offer is is the uh, development of a ne the next generation of people who will enter the workforce and. And they will they will enter having a clear sense of who they are and what they have to offer, and and as a result, the organizational uh, community will have to shift to okay. These are the people who are coming forward. How do we how do we adapt to them rather than them having to adapt to us? So so how do people find you if they want to talk with you or or learn more about the the uh, the index? Oh, they can they can reach out to me on on LinkedIn. So it's Robin Davis. Uh, my company is Assurativity Consulting Limited. That's a bit of a mouthful, but think of assurance and productivity and quality squished together into one word. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Assurativity, um, and there will be details on this on this podcast as well. So quite and happy. Would, and would you um, send me a link to the? You mentioned a couple of blog posts that you had written. Send me the links to that so we can put those in the show notes as well so that people can um, go directly to kind of your thinking about this. And that would be fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to do that. I mean, they're not they're not very pretty. I use I use Canva to do the graphics because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not overly creative. But it's, it's hard for me to get my ideas out of my head onto. onto We're not going to worry about that. I think the fact, the fact that you have created it and that you've offered these ideas, I think the ideas are really are, are what's significant. And 
you know, it's um, so that's why I think I think in particular pointing to some of the things you've written, I think is important for um, engaging people who might want to have further connection with you. Uh, I'm always, always happy to talk. Really? That's, that's, also, that's also one one of my problems. One of my problems of having quite an even profile <laughs> is that I, 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 I do have a propensity to burn out. So I'm always happy to help everyone else at the uh, well, I <laughs> Welcome to my world. So, <laughs> well, Robin, thank you for being here today. This has been fantastic. And, you know, I, I leave some, I leave with encouragement and hope for the future. Cause I think what you're giving to people through this methodology is um, also a reason for encouragement and hope and a sense of, Oh, this is how I can make contributions. And, and people, that's what people want, you know, is to know that and, and have affirmation of that. People, people just want to contribute. You know, if they feel valued, then you get so much out of them. And they want to give it. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And I, and those of you who are watching today, I I would encourage you to think to think about this as well. You know, think about the contributions you make. Um, wherever it may be, it may be in your community, it may be at school, it may be in some other form. But when you're making these contributions, it really is valuable and it's it's, it's really helpful to uh, strengthen the organization you may be working for, or the community where you live. And it's uh, it's worth recognizing that and being um, and and saying to yourself, how do I develop this more? How do I contribute more? Uh, so that I can have this sense of, uh, of accomplishment and that I'm a person of impact. So it's pretty good, Robin. This is pretty good. And so thank you everyone for, for being here. Thank you, Robin. And um, thank you, Ed, and thank you everyone. <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time on the Eddie Network podcast. Bye-bye.